Hello friends, this is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the definitive answers to one of the greatest mysteries in all of romantic music, and that is the question of whether the finale of Sibelius's Fourth Symphony calls for a glockenspiel or tubular bells. Well, the answer is glockenspiel. That has always been the answer, but that has not been what many, many, many conductors have done. And the reason was because of a misprint, a typo in the, in the published score. And really, it's astonishing how uh, people have failed to pick up on this mistake, even though the actual answer has been known really since the 1940s, well before Sibelius died. I mean, you'd think they just would have called him up and said, you know, hey, pal, hey, Sib, you know, what do you want, bells or glockenspiel? And in fact, sometimes they have told people to use the glockenspiel and they use bells anyway, because it's a conductor's prerogative. And it depends on how you think a passage ought to sound. But let's, let's uh, sort of define our terms just to make life simple, shall we? The bells in question are the standard concert tubular chimes. You know, there's like a big rack of them and they sit there and you take little hammers and you hit them up here and they make bell sounds. And they're lovely. I mean, they're wonderful instruments. Lots of composers write for them. The glockenspiel is actually a somewhat complicated issue because for much of its history, the glockenspiel was simultaneously known as a carillon, as like when Handel used one, he had con invented a contraption um, called the carillon, or when Mozart used the glockenspiel and the magic flute, the magic bells, that was a keyboard instrument. And the keyboard glockenspiel still exists. It is actually used in a lot of French music. For example, Debussy's La Mer asks for a glockenspiel or celesta. And the only way you get one or the other as equivalent is if they're keyboard instruments, because the celesta obviously is a keyboard instrument. And the part, as Debussy writes it, is rather keyboard-like. Mahler 7th uses a regular hammer glockenspiel and the keyboard instrument. Messiaen's Tarangalela Symphony has a virtuoso part for a keyboard glockenspiel. In those cases, it's called a claviatur glockenspiel. Claviatur meaning, of course, keyboard. Here is, just for the record, let me show you your average concert glockenspiel. There it is sitting on the floor in its usual position next to the cat scratching post, where everybody keeps their glockenspiel, of course. It goes without saying. That's where they go. So that is a glockenspiel, and I happen to have one here. They weigh a ton. They're made of solid steel, and they sound just lovely. And the Sibelius Fourth requires your glockenspiel, Give me a second here. Let me just show you something about them. You can play them with a variety of mallets, depending on how loud you want them to sound, because hitting it harder doesn't always make it that much louder. It's the quality of tone and the cutting quality that matters. And so I have here three different, three different pairs of glockenspiel mallets. I mean, anything could be a glockenspiel mallet as long as it's, you know, they can be soft tipped or plastic or hard, hard brass, which are the ones where you want the loudest kind of sound. So here is the part from Sibelius's Fourth Symphony, which has been the cause of so much hysteria right here. That's all you have to do. That was with the light mallet. If I use a slightly harder mallet, we get, hear the difference? I wasn't actually hitting it harder. You just get more clarity of sound. And if you use your, your brass sucker here, oh my, you're gonna have quite the sound. Here you go. That's it. Now, Sibelius only calls for three notes of the glockenspiel and in a four-note motive. But that motive has been, like I said, the object of hysteria. And I want to play you the sample, a sample of how it sounds in the actual symphony, 
with our fabulous performance with Life's Segerstam and the Helsinki Philharmonic on Ondine, just so you get a sense of what we're talking about. Here is its first entry in the finale. There it goes. But in the middle, in the middle of the movement, there is a big crescendo and a passage in which the the Lockenspiel part is augmented. It goes like this. Just like that. And Sibelius marks it sonore, meaning sonorously. And for that reason, because this is not exactly a sonorous instrument, people have thought tubular chimes would be appropriate. Some conductors use both. Some conductors use them simultaneously. Some people use tubular chimes only in that passage. Ormandy does in his last recording. It's very effective. You have to give him credit. But it's not what Sibelius wanted. And uh, let me play you that sonare passage too, just so you get a sense of, of what that sounds like. And imagine it with tubular bells. I could play you a version with tubular bells, but I think your imagination is absolutely up to the task. So here you go. All right. That is the source of the controversy. And this has, I mean, I, classical music people have nothing better to do but argue about these things and argue they do. I mean, this has caused, you can't imagine. I mean, marriages have been broken. Children have been sent to foster care. Murder and mayhem has ensued, all because nobody picked up the phone and asked Sibelius what he wanted. But even if they did, he might not have talked to them, or he might have given a contrary answer. However, happily, as part of the new Sibelius Complete Edition being published by Breitkopf and Hertel, the Fourth Symphony has come out, and the Fourth Symphony exists now in an or text, and the actual true story can at last be told, because all of the evidence has been sourced and collated. And I'm going to read it to you and just tell you what the evidence is so that we know. And then the answer is the answer, irrespective of what anyone else has done. So let us look first at this, this particular passage. Let's see about the history of the score, because it really is very, very, very interesting. Okay. The autograph score You'd think the autograph would be definitive. It isn't. It isn't at all. In fact, before you even get to that, let me just show you. This is the map. See this thing here? This is what, what critical editions do. This is the map of sources that had to be consulted in order to arrive at Sibelius' correct text. Because score, as you know, is not just the autograph. It's not just the first thing the composer thought of. It's everything that he did subsequently in revision and things he told people verbally and corrections he may have made in the orchestral parts or in someone else's score that they showed him and said, what do you think of this? It's a very, very complicated situation. So here's what they say. The autograph score was used in the first performance at April 3rd, 1911, together with a set of orchestral parts by four different copyists. The autograph contains some minor changes in ink, probably made during the composing. Sibelius revised the work thoroughly and made a fair copy, which he sent to the publisher. That was used as the engraver's copy and is presently lost. Sibelius read the proofs, which are also lost. Whether more than one set of proofs was read remains unknown. The first edition of the score and parts was published in February 1912 by Breitkopf. 
On October, in October 1912, Sibelius sent a list of corrections to Breitkopf and a new imprint was made. The proofs were also read. This imprint is designated E2, that's what they call it here, as a source. Um, also the score published by Dover Publications in 2003. The changes include the correcting of wrong pitches and the addition of missing consordino, that's muted, and naturale, unmuted markings in the string parts. Although revisions had been made, the first edition of the parts was engraved based on the unrevised orchestral parts, so the score and the parts diverged, which was also very annoying. So anyway, there's all kinds of stuff, and the bottom, the bottom line is, is that, let's see here, blah, 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 blah. Despite the corrections made in 1912, now we're getting to the meat of it, some errors remained in the score, and the question of whether the glockenspiel or tubular bell should be used arose. Sibelius, therefore, eventually prepared a score in which he marked all necessary changes and gave it to von Hasse, the head of Breitkopf, who visited him in the summer of 1942. So in all this time, all these mistakes had been sitting around in the score since 1911. These changes included correcting incorrect pitches, additions of missing markings, clarifications, such as the glockenspiel, and tempo indications. They were incorporated into the existing score copies by hand at the publishers, and one copy was sent to Sibelius. The additions also appear in the later imprints of the score. According to Breitkopf's, oh no, you know, his, their, their octen notice, their, their, their history of what they did in this particular case, corrections dating from 1942 were executed in the study score in 1991 and in the score in 1998. So the correct score wasn't actually printed until 1998 as regards the glockenspiel and the bells. And there's a special note on the glockenspiel, which we should also take into consideration. Sibelius's instrument designation for Campanelli, which they have it here because they use the Italian designation for glockenspiel, which is Campanelli, little bells, a big bell is a campana, right? So Campanelli reads, reads Stahlstäbe, which means steel bars. Now, Stahlstäbe is a synonym for glockenspiel. It is, it's used, for example, Sibelius calls for Stahlstäbe in the Oceanides. And everyone knows it's a glockenspiel. No one plays Oceanides without a glockenspiel. Actually, I think there was one where they actually used tubular bells, but I won't even go there. 99.9% of humanity has always known that Stahlstäbe means glockenspiel, and it's done that way, and that was Sibelius's term. And there's nothing unusual in this. I mean, you know, the, the, the xylophone, which was known as a xylophone for all of its existence, you know, Sansol called it a xylophone in the 1860s, was called Holtz und Stroh Instrumenta, and by Richard Strauss in Salome. Percussion instruments have nomenclature issues. The difference between gong and tam-tam, we've already discussed. They can be a little vague. So, but we know it's a glockenspiel because, here we go, um, Axel Karpelen also mentions the glockenspiel, which he called Glockspell, in his article from 1911 on the symphony. However, the designation Glocken, which is German for bells, in the first edition has resulted in the use of the glockenspiel, tubular bells, or both. Cecil Gray stated in his book, published in 1935, quote, in performance, by the way, this part is generally performed on the glockenspiel instead of the tubular bells, which would seem to be indicated in the score, unquote. Yussi Yalis, who was Sibelius's uh, son-in-law, who translated the book into Finnish, added a note, quote, the composer means here glockenspiel and has himself corrected the misleading marking in the score. So again, there was no mystery about what Sibelius wanted. The only question was if anyone asked or if they had access to the actual corrected material that would that would give them the right answer. So in E2, which is the corrected version of the score with Sibelius's markings, the designation Glocken was complemented with Spiel on the first page of Movement 4, and SP period was added to the abbreviated designations by hand in 1942. 
Still later, Yalis added that Sibelius, quote, also considered it important that the glockenspiel should not be too small, unquote. This is a whole other issue, of course. Size of glockenspiel. Glockenspiels come in different sizes. And in fact, the bigger orchestral glockenspiels actually have resonators like vibraphones underneath them to give it even more, even more voluminous sound quality. So, and they can weigh a lot. They can be very heavy. So there's, there, there, there are a lot of different models of glockenspiels, all the way from the band instruments, you know, the, the bell lyra, the band bells, which you play vertically, to this sort of horizontal thing, to the keyboard model. So you can have all kinds of glockenspiels, but they are all high pitched bells. That's really the point. So, he didn't want it to be too small. Still later, Yalis added that Sibelius, quote, uh, oh, pardon me, we said that already. The question concerning the use of the glockenspiel or the tubular bells was also posed to Sibelius's biographer, Eric Thomas Stierna, in his reply to conductor Herbert Blomstedt, who uses tubular bells. He wrote that Sibelius's daughter, Katerina Ilvis, quote, told me that Sibelius had been very impressed by Stokowski's interpretation of the Fourth Symphony, with one exception. He did not like the tubular bells in the finale. They sound too oriental, he said. And Yalis also, who took notes from Sibelius on issues with the score of the Fourth, indicated that Sibelius wanted a glockenspiel. So, Sibelius's original intent was glockenspiel. Sibelius told anyone who cared to listen that he wanted a glockenspiel, and conductors went and did whatever they damn well pleased anyway. And that is the answer. I hope that this clears up the, the question, because I saw in the commentary on the Sibelius Fourth, all of the usual bullshit trotted out about some people said bells, and it was Stokowski, it was this, it was that, it was this is how it happened. The real answer is that that correction, Sibelius's correction, to clarify the original misprint in the original published score was made in 1912. It wasn't entered into the score until 1942, which wasn't published until 1998. And that is why we have the multiplicity of versions that we do. Now, do I think that this is a life or death issue with respect to the finale of Sibelius's fourth? I do not. It is a detail. It is an interesting detail, and I happen to think that the glockenspiel timbrely is the correct instrument, rather than tubular chimes, which are kind of ill-focused and hard to hear and get buried in the texture, and, and you know, except for that one passage where you could whack, you know, whack them loudly and get what you want and let them resonate. So, so I think that that's the most appropriate instrument. But I also think Sibelius clearly intended it should be heard. He knew that there was a problem. He didn't seem to make any loud statements about it. He didn't write to Leopold Stokowski and say, you asshole, you blew it, you used tubular bells, because obviously he wanted his music to be played. He wanted it to be accepted. He wanted conductors to have the freedom to do what conductors do. And his own personal opinion of how successful they were, he largely kept to himself unless he was asked. But that, my friends, is the answer. It is and always was a glockenspiel. So keep on listening to your Sibelius's fourth fourths and enjoy your glockenspiel part. Thank you for joining me. Take care, folks.